Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Christy Baglow. I'm the director of the statewide training initiative at Florida Legal Services. And I am excited to have with us a great panel of fair housing experts today. Thank you to Community Legal Services in Mid-Florida, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Disability Rights Florida, and Bay Area Legal Services for lending us their experts in fair housing today. This is a two-part webinar series, so be sure to register for next Monday's webinar, which will be on May 4th from 9 to 12 again. Uh, this will be recorded, so you can refer back to it, and if your coworkers were not able to attend today, I will send the video out after we're done. You'll see on your screen a handout section in GoToWebinar, and you can access the PowerPoints there and download them. There is also a shared Google Drive that I've sent to everyone for more detailed information. If you have any problems with the video or accessing the materials, just send me a little chat. We will have time for questions at the end of each presentation. So feel free to type them in at any time and I'll keep an eye on those. We'll answer them at the end. We'll also have about a 10 minute break at the end of each presentation after the questions. We have applied for a CLE credit for this pro program, but the Florida Bar is closed right now. So they are not processing those applications. So I hope to be able to get retroactive CLE credit, but I will keep you all posted. So our first speaker today will be Andrea Mosley. Andrea is the managing attorney of the Fair Housing Program at Community Legal Services in Mid-Florida. And she has been litigating cases in the consumer housing and fair housing units for the past six years. Prior to her time at CLSMF, Andrea was a solo practitioner for several years and an assistant public defender for the Ninth Judicial Circuit. I'm doing abbreviated bios, but they are in your handouts, the more detailed ones. We will also have Katherine Hanson joining us today. Katherine is a senior staff attorney with Disability Rights Florida, where she focuses her practice on disability rights and housing law. Prior to joining Disability Rights Florida, Katherine was the co-director of Jacksonville Area Legal Aid's Fair Housing Unit, where she practiced fair housing, landlord-tenant, and consumer law. Catherine was a 2018 recipient of the National Consumer Law Center's Rising Star Award. And lastly, joining us from the Department of Housing and Urban Development in Atlanta will be James Barakal Jr. James is a retiree of the United States Navy with a prestigious career of 26 years. He joined the Department of Housing and Urban Development in 2017 as a bilingual intake analyst. He is considered a subject matter expert in the processing of Spanish limited English proficiency claims. And he is located in Atlanta, Georgia. So thank you all for joining us. Everyone is muted. So please, if you have questions, we have a lot of attendees today. So make sure you type it in the question box or the chat box on the right hand side. And I will turn this over to Andrea to get us started off with her presentation about reasonable accommodations. Oh, let me make sure we've got the sound on for you, Andrea. I don't hear you. Okay, there's your sound. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Most people prefer me muted anyway. So. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. As Christy said, I am the uh, Fair Housing Manager, one of two at Community Legal Services. Um, and uh, this webinar started as you know, a COVID idea, you know, I was at home feeling stir crazy and I was like, hey, let's have a webinar. So um, I called the smartest people I know 
and asked them if they would help and they all said yes. So um, I would like to thank all of them uh, for saying yes um, and being willing to participate. Um, we all have caseloads and coming up with this presentation. Um, you know, I was doing it until last night. So please forgive me if I spelled something wrong or slipped in a picture of my dog. It was unintentional. Okay, you ready to go? I am just showing my screen right now. Make sure we got it. All right, can everyone see my screen? All right, we're ready to go. Thank you. All right, so I like to um, have my fellow lawyers refer to me as Dr. Mosley because I think it's hilarious. So I put Dr. Mosley on everything. So when you ask your questions, kindly say, Dr. Mosley, I have a question. No? Okay. So I thought we would start with a very fast, super quick, really quick Fair Housing 101. This is not meant to be a Fair Housing 101 webinar. Um, we're going to dive deeper into specific subjects but I thought it would be helpful just to do a very quick touch on the things that would help you throughout the presentation. So uh, next slide. And the next slide are the protected classes um, in case you did not know them. For reasonable accommodations, we're going to be focusing on one particular protected class. On the next slide, you will see what actions are uh, prohibited by the Fair Housing Act. And on the screen, on the slide that follows, you will see housing providers not covered under the Fair Housing Act. So who is covered? Everyone who's not listed here. Um, okay, so that's your Fair Housing 101 review. Any questions before I move forward? No? All right. So as part of fair housing, um, and anyone who would who practices fair housing will tell you that fair housing and landlord tenant are often uh, intertwined and clients will have one problem, uh, one of either problem and end up with both. So um, a housing protection Practitioner should be able to issue spot in each area. We're on to the next slide now. Um, your client may come to you um, on a notice to terminate and their concern is that a, a eviction has been filed or will be filed um, and they're not aware or even able to communicate with you that they would benefit from a reasonable accommodation because they may not know. Um, and a reasonable accommodation request or an RA can be sent in response to notices. Um, and an RA can be filed while an eviction is pending. Now with the new HUD opinion, they say there's an inference of bad faith, but I don't care, you can still do it. Um, and opposing counsel will be upset and that is their problem. They still have to consider your reasonable accommodation request and the new uh, guidelines say it needs to be done within 10 days. So um, there is, there are some things you can do with opposing counsel when you send a reasonable accommodation request in the middle of an eviction. Um, usually you would ask for a, a continuance because by federal law, they are required to consider your reasonable accommodation request. And we all know that federal law trumps state law. Um, opposing counsel will usually want to uh, have a settlement agreement um, and particular opposing counsels uh, favor particular clauses. Just remember that a probationary period or automatic defaults are not in your client's best interest if your client is disabled, especially automatic defaults. If someone is disabled and it's a mental disability, um, they could automatically, they could default without intentionally defaulting. So please be aware of that. Um, and um, do your best to not agree with those. Next slide. Okay. 
when you are evaluating landlord tenant cases uh, for fair housing issues, you should always ask yourself, what is the issue? Uh, can the issue be addressed or resolved with a reasonable accommodation request? Does the housing provider fall under the act? Is the tenant still in possession? Um, and is there a disability nexus need? Um, also remember that there is such a thing as a compulsory counterclaim. So if the eviction has arose because of a disability related issue um, and uh, the housing provider has failed to grant an accommodation, any anything like that, that is a compulsory counterclaim and it must be filed with the eviction or you waive it. Um, typically you have a right to go to federal court for these claims, but I have not been able to find a case that did not say it wasn't a compulsory panic killing um, and the federal court will kick you back to state court. Um, reasonable accommodations and landlord tenant. So I've given you some examples of when you would have a landlord tenant case and you could uh, possibly have um, a solution with a reasonable accommodation request. Noise complaints. Uh, so someone may have a mental health issue, um, which causes them to scream at night. Um, they may have a, a child who is autistic, or someone may have PTSD. Um, authorized, unauthorized occupants, again, a mental health issue, or um, they may have someone basically acting as a live-in aid, um, but have never notified anyone of it. Um, violation of a no pet policy, that's an emotional support animal. Um, multiple police visits could come for many reasons, not just um, mental health, autism, uh, PTSD. It could also come uh, from domestic violence situations, which wouldn't be solved with the RA, but just be aware. Uh, failure to maintain the property, uh, that could be because your client uh, has a physical disability and can't. Uh, do it on their own or need more time to comply than what was given in the notice um, or the person has um, mental health issues. Um, again, dirty houses, hoarders, uh, physical disabilities, parking spaces, um, smoking violations. So medical marijuana, that is a fun one and um, it's emerging issue. So when we are dealing with medical marijuana, I have uh, a question for you all. You all up for a question? Because it's early and I would like you all to wake up. What do you think? All right, so uh, we have a client and let's say just for, you know, I'm just gonna pull this out of my hat. Lizzie is our client and Lizzie lives in public housing. And Lizzie has a prescription for medical marijuana, uh, which is now legal. Uh, and Lizzie um, would like an accommodation of the rules uh, to allow her to smoke her medical marijuana. Uh, is Lizzie allowed to have her medical marijuana? Who thinks she is? We have a couple of votes for no, Andrea. All right. Any votes for yes? Not yet. No. You guys are no fun. You already know the answer. <laughs> no, she is not. Uh, and, the and the answer is why? Why? Why can't she? For anyone who said no, why can't she? And I cannot see any responses, so. Okay, so we have a um, kind of a question. Did she request reasonable accommodation? Yes, she the, did. Okay, the second comment is HUD guidance allows the landlord to make that determination. Property owner's rights, not considered a medication under federal law. A lot of people, it is against federal law. And that is the answer. It is against federal law. Even Yay. if 
even if medical marijuana is legal in your particular state or city or county, it is still illegal federally. Uh, so just please be aware before you send out a reasonable accommodation request for medical marijuana and someone lives in subsidized or public housing, um, you will not succeed on that ground. Okay, next slide. All right, we're going to talk about reasonable combinations and modifications. What is a reasonable accommodation request? Well, it is a request for uh, an exemption adjustment of the rules, policies, practices, and services um, under Section 504 of a housing provider to give a disabled person equal opportunity to use and enjoy the dwelling. We're on the next slide. So, for example, you will have a no pet policy or a no dog policy or a no dog over um, 50 pounds policy. Um, all those things are subject to uh, emotional support animal or service animal exemption. Um, if you have paid parking spots or no assigned parking, that is also a reasonable accommodation request. Uh, next slide. Um, there is a, a joint statement from HUD in regards to reasonable accommodation requests, which will either uh, you can either see or access on the Google Drive. Um, I could technically spend an hour talking about every joint statement I'm going to refer to an hour on each statement, but you guys would not enjoy an eight hour day of me going through HUD opinions. So I'm just referencing them and supplying them to you so that you can read them on your own. If you're going to practice fair housing, you should read them um, and be aware of them when they come out. So that's the first one that's in regards to reasonable accommodation. Next slide. <clears throat> so what is needed for a reasonable accommodation request? Well, I tried to break it down into three simple words. Um, I was trying to make it come up with a, you know, a nice mnemonic like uh, Dan or something, but I couldn't do it. So disability, nexus, um, and need, right? And necessity. So for everything, you have to be disabled. Uh, if you're not disabled, you do not fall under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, there has to be a nexus, which is a connection between your disability and what you are requesting and it has to be a necessity and that it alleviates one or more, uh, alleviates or mitigates one or more symptoms of your disability. So keep that in mind as you evaluate um, accommodation requests and going forward, because I may ask a question, uh, you never know. All right, so uh, what is disability? Next slide. Disability uh, is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, individuals are regarded uh, as having such an impairment or individuals with a record of such an impairment. We're on the next slide, Christy. So the definition of a, a major life activity is seeing, hearing, walking, breathing. Oops, you went too far. Seeing, walking, breathing, caring for yourself, uh, learning, speaking, uh, performing manual tasks. So any disability that would necessarily uh, involve those things um, is a disability. So it wouldn't be hard to know that if it involves seeing, if you're blind, you're disabled. If it involves hearing and you're deaf, you're disabled, right? Um, and so if you're in a wheelchair and you cannot walk, you're disabled. So following along with that, um, on the next slide, the ADA has several um, recognized conditions which are disabilities, deafness or blindness, uh, intellectual disabilities, autism, HIV, traumatic brain injury, uh, cerebral palsy, 
muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, uh, partial or completely missing limbs, uh, mobility impairments requiring a wheelchair, major depressive disorder, bipolar, uh, PTSD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and schizophrenia. Um, and sometimes when you're dealing with someone with a mental health issue, they may, they may not be aware that they have one. So you need to be aware that it is a possibility based on how your client is behaving with you, uh, what they are accused of doing, um, the current issue that they have. Um, they may not be um, aware of such. And so when Lizzie speaks, she's going to talk to you a little bit um, about elder issues, but it would also um, apply to anyone who is uh, laboring under a disability. Sometimes they just may not know. And if they don't know, um, you may have to um, hear from a loved one or a friend or uh, a, a paramour, as one of my favorite attorneys usually says, um, they may be able to tell you that um, this person has this issue, okay? So be aware that you may not get it directly from the client. You just have to be aware of what's going on and the various symptoms. Now, on to the next slide, which is hoarding. Hoarding is always uh, one of my um, favorite and least favorite topics. So um, Lizzie's smiling because I, she is aware that I have had uh, at least one hoarding client and it was quite an adventure, okay? And I will tell you that hoarding is a recognized disability um, and as such, you don't need a letter from a doctor saying she's disabled. If she's hoarding, she's disabled. If he's hoarding, he's disabled. Whoever's hoarding, they're disabled. Um, it is a compulsive disorder. Um, and, it, and it's basically acquiring excessive amount of items uh, with no uh, apparent value or no concern for value. Um, and discarding items that others may consider to be trash feels like throwing away a piece of themselves. That's why it's so hard because you will say, hey, you're about to lose your house, just clean up. Just, just throw it all out. Would you rather be on the street, right? That makes sense, right? It, it's either you or your stuff. That makes sense to us. But to them, they are throwing away a piece of themselves and they can't do it. Also, they are ashamed of the condition. Um, they may have justified it in their own brain. Um, they are overwhelmed by the situation. Um, they, it causes them anxiety to think about it. Or they may have another, uh, and typically do, another diagnosis, which... Uh, I shouldn't say diagnosis um, condition because they may have not been diagnosed. It can sometimes be a symptom of another mental health issue, depression, severe depression. And, and, it, and, the, and the items could also cause them anxiety. They could be schizophrenic. Um, I had a client who was schizophrenic um, and hoarding um, as part of the, the schizophrenia. Um, it will lead to indecisiveness and avoidance and shame and procrastination. And it just feeds the cycle of the hoarding because the only thing that brings them comfort is to accumulate more stuff. Um, and so they will either feel safe or uh, uh, this type of thing has an emotional significance. Um, one thing I hear a lot is I will probably need it in the future. Um, and they don't want to waste anything. Uh, so I will say, if you are going to, <coughs> excuse me, if you're dealing with a hoarder, know that it is a disability, uh, but also know that you are only going to be successful if this person who is hoarding also has um, the intervention of a social worker, a case manager, um, someone like that. Without that, whatever you do for them is ultimately, in my experience, not going to be successful because it is a compulsive disorder that they can't help. And if no one is helping them with the disorder, they will keep doing it. They, will, they can try their best to get rid of the things, but because it is a uh, 
a disorder that they can't really control, they need help. Um, and when you're dealing with a hoarder, what I like to do, especially if it's public housing, is you send a reasonable accommodation to clean up the stuff um, for more time to get the house and uh, the apartment or house in order. But I also send it to the housing authority because what happens is they will get the notice and then they'll also have their voucher terminated. So you need to send your reasonable accommodation request to both the housing authority and the landlord. And that is uh, kind of my standard practice if I'm dealing with uh, a housing authority situation. Um, even if it's section eight, I will send it to the landlord and I will send it to uh, the housing authority. Um, any questions before I move forward with um, after talking with talking about hoarders? Yes, Andrea, we did have one question come in. Can you give an example uh, of a record of such impairment? Now, I'm not sure which disability um, she was referring to. Oh, okay. So um, the definition of disability is uh, sometimes you have a record or you're regarded as disabled. So um, I would say um, anybody who would know um, if they um, would say that this person has this problem or has had this problem for a while, I think it all kind of falls within that. It's hard to, it, without a doctor, it's hard to document, but you would have um, someone who would know uh, to state, you know, she's had this over the years or depending on the disab disability, um, possibly police reports or um, medical um, visits, but you want to be careful of that because you don't want to disclose too much information to a housing provider because um, they don't need it and, and it's not required. Any other questions? That's it for now. Okay. That was a classic attorney, it depends answer. So how do you uh, establish disability for a reasonable accommodation? Well, um, it's kind of along what we were talking about. Um, if the housing provider uh, known or should have known, what? how can the housing provider know or should have known, does anyone think? So while you guys are trying to think whether you're going to answer, um, my presentation style in person is I go around and I call on people and I wait for them to answer. I think this webinar will be more fruitful to you if you participate as, as opposed to having me read these slides to you. Uh, so known or should have known. How would a, a housing provider know or should have known that a person is disabled? How do you think? What do you think? All right, we have some responses coming in. The first one is the landlord has been asked in the past for a reasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes tenants tell the landlord thinking they can trust the landlord. Mm -hmm. And the last one is physical versus mental. Oh, you mean if it's obvious? I guess so. <laughs> it's hard to tell on webinars. You can't make people laugh. <laughs> okay, possibly. Another, okay. another response was they may be receiving SSD or SSI. Mm -hmm. And another person said SSI also. They could have mentioned it in their rental application. Great responses, everyone. Thanks for participating. Yeah, that is that is excellent. And you will have to all keep participating because I'll sit here and drink my coffee because I already know this stuff. That's what, <laughs> that's what I always tell we people. We have a few more that just came in. Um, the housing provider could look at the type of assistance they are receiving. Right. Uh, sometimes tenants are working with a social service provider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, all of those are correct and wonderful. And um, I'm so happy that you guys know these things um, because when you are sometimes dealing with the uh, opposing side, um, they may say, well, we need a letter from a doctor that says they're disabled. And we all know that that is not the case, right? You can say that this person is obviously disabled, right? They're in a wheelchair, they walk with a cane, they have a limp. Uh, 
they have to certify every year and you know that their their income source is social security disability um, or they volunteered that they are disabled um, all those things mean that the housing provider uh, known should have known uh, that this person is disabled um, you can have a credible statement by an individual um, a doctor or other medical professional peer support group uh, a non-medical service agency a reliable third party now who's that well hey my big sister knows that since the day i was born since i was five i have been uh you know hearing voices or whatever the case may be that is a credible third party uh who would be better to know than someone who has known me all my life so please be aware there are other ways uh to establish disability um the particular rub comes in when you have to establish uh, for certain requests like emotional support animals and that type of thing sometimes you the guidance does require um, a medical letter but you can establish disability many 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 ways okay um, now everyone knows that the housing provider can't ask for specifics on the disability um, and the housing provider should only seek information that is necessary to evaluate whether an accommodation is necessary because of disability. What will happen, though, is that the um, clients will send, um, will sign these releases, and the medical doctor will just send your entire medical file um, or send the last um, time you visited and ask for the, the note. They will say your diagnosis. They will say your your weight. They'll give your whole medical history. And that's what you give to the uh, housing provider. And that's too much. And um, when my clients come to me with that and they haven't handed it over yet, I say, no, this is not going to work. Um, we need to do a different letter. Um, you should not be disclosing your client's medical history even if that's what they give you to disclose um, because clients don't know better. Um, now, sometimes there are timing issues and things like that, but I would say do your very best not to disclose um, too many medical details. Um, next slide. Andrea, before we move on, do you mind answering a question about senior complexes? Uh, well, we will have Lizzie speaking soon, so you might want to hold on to that. I'll um, save that. Yeah, let's, let's hold on to that, and we may be able to um, deal with that. But what's, what's the question so I have it in mind? Because I can't Okay, the it. question is, how do you establish disability and reasonable accommodation for common area repairs and distinguish your client as disabled, even though many other residents might be and not get stuck in the landlord tenant zone. Mm, common area repairs, mm, that's fascinating. Okay, let's keep that in the back of our mind. All right, denials. When can a reasonable accommodation request be denied group? This is this is one of those Fair Housing 101 questions. When can you be denied? Well, it's right there on the slide. If uh, there is no disability or no disability related need and it is not reasonable. Now, having done this for a while, um, I often get responses from private attorneys who don't know fair housing law but they did a quick Google search in response to my RA and they will say, this is not reasonable. And what they mean by that is we don't like it and we don't want to do it. But the law says that there's only uh, a small criteria for whether my request is reasonable or not. And that is if my request is a fundamental alteration of the essential nature of the provider's operations, if it provides undue financial and administrative burden, um, if the person or animal is a clear and present danger to the health and safety of other tenants, and uh, the actions have or will result in significant structural damage. Okay, so let's sit with that for a minute. What do you think? What do you think is a fundamental 
alteration of the essential nature of a provider's operations. What would that be? I mean, we all read it, we all look at it, but what is it? Uh, well, if we're dealing with a housing provider, anything that would alter um, them from being a housing provider. So if it's not in relation to providing housing or a service that they already provide, um, it can be a fundamental alteration of uh, the essential nature of the provider's operations. So for instance, um, if you're physically disabled and you can't make it to the bus stop and you want the maintenance person to come pick you up and his little um, cart that he picks up, you know, other things with and around the park and drive you to the bus stop, that is a, a fundamental alteration of the essential nature of the provider's operations. They're in the business of, of housing, not transportation, right? So any um, questions about that? right there, the fundamental alteration. We all have that. We all kind of have a idea, a concept of what that is. We feel comfortable knowing if something is a fundamental alteration. We just had a comment come in that an agoraphobic person may ask people to go shopping for them because they cannot leave the house. Right. Again, excellent. Yes, that is another example of a fundamental alteration. And I don't know about you, but um, because of this COVID, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I don't get agoraphobic and decide I will not leave the house. Um, but we'll see. I'm feeling kind of, are you guys feeling a little stressed because of COVID? It's okay if you are, because I am, and we can all be stressed together. Um, but yes, uh, undue financial and administrative burden. Ooh, what's an example of that? What's undue financial and administrative burden? Installing an elevator in a building. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, installing a walkway from your house to, from your apartment to something that's, you know, half a football field away because um, you don't want to go on, because you can't go on the grass. Um, different things like one. I want granite installed on my floor because I'm allergic to carpets <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> oh gosh I will not um I will not tell you that story but I have a story <laughs> I will not share it <laughs> Well, thank you for bringing it up. I think I know who did, but thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> yes, that is um, a prime example of undue financial burden um, in that you need an accommodation, but you want a particular, uh, you want it solved in a particular way that's going to be very costly for the housing provider. Um, granite floor marble if people do marble floors i don't know but you know something like that is very costly and the, and the housing provider does not have to do that um but the note says even if it is unreasonable they have to participate in what's called the interactive process and i will sometimes use that term when i'm trying to um reach out to a um, housing provider um and i know that what i'm what I'm doing is a close call or my client um, doesn't always have what they need to establish everything they need to establish. I will go, let's try and start the interactive process. And what's the interactive process where um, if they say uh, this is unreasonable um, and we can do, instead of uh, granite floors, we can do, um, what are floors made of? Uh, wood, we can do wood. Um, then you can go back and forth about um, what would be a suitable um, alternative to what you're requesting if what you're requesting um, is undue financial or administrative burden or changes the essential nature of the provider's operations. For instance, if you need them to lay down um, a cement walkway that's half a fo football field away, um, another um, option would be, how about we just relocate you to a, a unit that is closer to where you're trying to get to, 
or uh, closer to the, the ramp that's already there. Um, that's, that's an option. Um, so with um, animals, sometimes they will um, say that, you know, they, they can't have this animal because it's a dangerous breed. Um, and the uh, HUD has been clear that you can't make any breed uh, related restrictions on service animals or on um, emotional support animals. So you can't um, deny an animal because of its breed um, or any uh, theories about, okay, this is a dangerous breed. It has to be uh, based on the actions of the individual animal. So as a, a person with way too many dogs, um, I have a chihuahua and I have a pit bull. And I will tell you that you are more likely to get bit by my chihuahua because they are mean little, little things and they will bite. So if you have a emotional support animal and that animal um, bites someone, what happens with your emotional support animal? Anyone? I what don't happens? think you need to speculate. <laughs> uh, here we go. Here we go. Um, the animal can be removed because it has the propensity to bite. The mm -hmm. reasonable accommodation can be denied. Mm -hmm. um, yep. It could be destroyed. Oh. The premises. Who's going to destroy your emotional support? <laughs> <laughs> animal control maybe um there is a sort of a question mixed in here what if the insurance has a provision that if you allow the restricted breed they will not cover excellent so if your um if the housing provider says the insurance will not cover that breed if the housing provider says uh local zordon zoning ordinances will not cover that breed um they need to um apply for uh, an accommodation they need to inform their insurance company that they have an accommodation request and by federal law, they have to um, honor it. Um, and they need to apply for an exemption uh, to the zoning regulations to the zoning boards. So they have to take a step to try and comply with the law. They can't just say, I can't do it. Okay. Remember, this is, remember, this is federal law, not state law and supremacy, supremacy clause. I can't say it this morning, but you know what it is. Supremacy clause. I always remember that. Um, also, if you have someone with, who is schizophrenic and um, runs out in the middle of the street naked, screaming at people, um, or gets into a, a, a fight with a neighbor, okay? Um, they may want to argue that this person is a clear and present danger now. Here's, depending on the circumstances, you can get around that. And let me tell you how. If um, if the person does not um, use a weapon during this altercation, then part of what you're gonna have to do is a little bit of what I like to call lawyer social work. You're gonna have to make sure that they are on medication, um, that they are seeing a uh, medical provider, and that, um, they will, you know, have, you know, check-ins and can report that they are complying with their medication schedule. That is a way to kind of um, counter the argument that they are a danger. Now, if they use a weapon or severely hurt someone, I, I think you're out of luck no matter what. But um, in situations where there was just a fight or a screaming back and forth and maybe property damage, that type of thing, you can still uh, work with that. So just be aware, um, but it's gonna require, like I said, a little bit of social work on your part. So uh, just be prepared for that. Um, know about agencies that can help people um, comply. Um, Cause many, many, many places have caseworkers and um, you just need to know what to ask the client for because a lot of these mental health uh, conditions, if you don't ask the exact right word, then you never ask them.
Um, I've had that come up quite a few times. Um, and I've said, you know, you know what I was getting at. And they were like, no, you never asked me. So I never told you uh, that that is uh, a common thing that happens to me quite often. So be aware of that. Um, actions that will result in significant structural change. Well, uh, the most, the easiest one is a hoarder, right? If they have too many things, um, uh, they could destroy the floor. Um, they could invite pests. Um, they are a, uh, a fire hazard, all these things. So if, they, if their hoarding has gotten to an extent that the floor underneath is damaged or gone or, you know, that type of thing, um, they don't have to uh, continue to do that because that's, that's a danger. Any questions about denials before I move forward? We have a couple questions. Let me cool. go back and see if they're about denials. Okay, so the first one is uh, the third party who is not a professional is argued a lot in court. Um, yes. I have read a case where a judge, no matter how much knowledge the third party has of the person's disability, has dismissed the case because a professional was not involved and there was no professional diagnosis. Yes. I, I do not, I do not disagree. And I think that um, uh, next next week, Marty will tell you um, that you do not go to court without a medical doctor letter. Um, and I don't disagree with that, but not all cases will uh, go to court, right? Um, so as many cases, as many reasonable accommodations I've, as I've had, and I've had a lot of them, not all of them are suitable for court. Um, so sometimes you have to deal with the hand that you're dealt, right? So if you don't have that, then your best route might be a 903 instead of going to court. So um, just just be aware of that. But I, I, I agree with you. Um, and I think Marty, who's presenting next week, will absolutely agree with you if that wasn't Marty himself. Um, yes, you can't, um, you shouldn't. He's said this to me, you have to have a doctor's letter if you're gonna to go to court. Um, and listen, it's unfortunate, but it's true. The, um, these are, this is HUD guidance, it's not law, right? It's not um, a statute. So if you're going based on the HUD guidance then, and it's not a strong court, it wouldn't also stand up in court, then you need to pursue the 903 route as opposed to the court route. Okay, and we had one more question. How about when you have a client who is hoarding things and the complex is claiming your client's messy, cluttered apartment puts other tenants at risk? Right, it does. But you're going to ask for accommodation to allow her, him or her to correct that. That's the point of the accommodation. Um, hoarding is a disability. So it's a disability. So you send the reasonable accommodation request and what you're asking for is more time to come into compliance, right? Um, because ultimately that's the goal. That's all they want. They want your client to come into compliance. Um, and so usually it's a seven day notice and, and no hoarder or anyone with a lot of stuff can get that out in seven days, okay? So what you're asking for is more time to come into compliance. That, that request is going to, again, work better if they are working with a mental health professional. Because you can say, listen, this person is now in treatment and we have community organizations that's willing to help them. And understand the cleaning out process is just as traumatic as anything else, right? Because you can't just go in with a bulldozer and, um, you know, grab the stuff and pull it out and have it clean. That's not how it works. You know, these are people's possessions that may appear worthless to you or I, but it's very meaningful to them. So you can't just go in. I mean, we've all watched hoarders. It's a very, you're like, why is this so hard for you? Um, but it's because it's a mental illness. And so they need time. Now, you're not going to get indefinite time, but they do need time. 
And so it, it becomes an easier process if they're working with someone to get it done. Uh, I, and I will tell you that most hoarders I've come across are very intelligent individuals. And when I say very intelligent, I mean it. They are very smart, but they have a really hard time uh, dealing with, with the possession, the number of it, the people's reactions to it. So it's a whole complicated scenario. So you're gonna ask for more time to comply. And they have to, by law, give it to you. So you ask, you send the reasonable accommodation request to the landlord and you send it to the housing provider. And then you do your best to ensure that your client is um, um, proceeding, receiving mental health services. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit because I look like we're running out of time already. Um, you, they can't deny you if you don't use magic language, like I need a, a reasonable accommodation request, right? They can say, listen, um, you know, I lost my leg. I need this. Uh, they can just say it. They don't have to say reasonable accommodation request. It could be oral. It does not have to be in writing there. It does not re uh, require a particular form. Be aware of this. A lot of housing providers will take no action unless your client fills out a form. That is against the law. If they make the request, they have to respond. The form is not required. And so if your client just made a verbal request and they took no response because the form wasn't filled out, then they violated the law. Um, there are um, no fees or extra deposits or insurance. A lot of times, if you're dealing with a, a, a breed uh, that they're uncomfortable with, they want you to get insurance, extra insurance that is not necessary. Um, and you can say no to that. Uh, no extra deposits, you can say no, no, none of that, no fees associated with a reasonable accommodation request. Next slide, Christy. Um, what, what is a reasonable uh, modification? So a modification is um, a, a, a structural change to existing premises, grab bar lift bars in the bathroom, uh, removing carpet through the allergies, lowering cabinets because you are now in a wheelchair, um, installing light indication for doorbells, that's a modification. Um, there is a HUD statement on modifications, as you can see. There, there is a HUD statement on just about everything. Um, but there you are. And what's funny is I didn't know this existed and so I found it yesterday, so. Uh, so there are additional reasonable modification considerations. Um, unless you, next, next slide, Christy. Uh, next slide. Uh, unless you have a, oh, too far. Unless you have a subsidy. Oh, you're going too far, Christy. Christy's going ahead. We're running out of time. Christy wants me to hurry up. The computer is doing it by itself. Just a second. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Christy said, get this show on the road. <laughs> um, so unless you have a subsidy or your housing provider receives some kind of federal assistance, uh, the client is required to pay for the modifications and may be required to return the house to original condition. Um, they have to have prior, prior approval before they do a modification. Um, and the housing provider, HP is a housing provider, um, can require a, a permit and that the work be performed in a workmanlike manner um, and can uh, require a more aesthetically pleasing alteration if there's no additional cost to the tenant. Um, so let me uh, address this uh, just a bit. So clients are often surprised that they have to pay for a modification. Um, if, so when it comes, no, you have to know the difference between what you're asking for. Now, if you are dealing with subsidized or public housing, there is no difference. It doesn't make a difference. Everything's a reasonable accommodation, even a modification, right? So if you're dealing with public housing or, or something like that, it's all reasonable accommodation. It doesn't matter. And they pay. But if you're dealing with a, a, a different kind of housing provider, uh, then it's, you have to be clear what you're asking for. It's a reasonable modification. Um, and I have seen cases, and I haven't had a chance to delve into this deeper, um, where if you're asking for a reasonable modification and your 
housing provider does not have to pay, uh, then you have to say that you're going to do this at your own expense in your modification request. Um, so uh, modifications have to be done at, at the uh, tenants or requesters um, expense. So sometimes we're dealing with something as simple as grab bars and your client has zero income. And, uh, you know, the, their income is, they don't have enough to have grab bars done. Now, I will, I've seen it both ways where um, landlords are not required, but because they want it to look a certain way, they'll install it. Um, they'll just install it. Um, and then I've seen others who are just horrible and they'll just go, no, we're not gonna pay for it. They can pay for it themselves. Which they are, can, which they can do. Um, but just be aware of that when your client is asking for a modification, when you speak to them, when you're talking to them, let them know if indeed they have to pay for it. Um, work perform in a workmanlike manner. Can the housing provider require a particular contractor? What do you think? And, and when I drink my coffee, that means I'm waiting for you to answer. You got a no and a yes. Okay. So the housing provider cannot uh, require a particular contractor. They cannot require that you work with their favorite contractor. They can't do that. Um, is restoration required? For the sake of time, I'm going to answer this question. Um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, like all good legal questions, it depends, right? So if the person coming after you can make some uh benefit of this uh or the landlord can have benefit of it usually you will not have to restore it but if it is just something that is uh particular to you and will be of use to you and no one else then yes you have to restore it when you leave um all right so we have to move a little forward because we're going late now we're going to deal with older americans what is the problem with old folks, Lizzie? Uh, the problem with old folks is age is not a protected class. Um, however, they will usually fall into another protected class, and that's disability. Um, we all kind of age the same, and things stop working on you as you get older. Um, and uh, this is just part of life. So you can kind of get around the age not being a protected class issue, uh, usually with disability. Um, and then as a note, uh, registered 55 plus and 65 plus communities have what's called familial status exemption, right? Um, but they have to comply with the remainder of the Fair Housing Act. And I've had to send reasonable accommodation letters that say, while you are, um, are exempt from familial status, you must honor the rest of the um, protected classes because they need a reminder every once in a while. They think sometimes they think they're exempt from the entire thing and they are not. It is clear. So um, please remember that. And then usually it's only a certain percentage of people have to be this age, that type of thing. So there can be ways around it, but just be aware um, that's the issue with older Americans. Um, but in, in, with COVID coming around, um, a lot of things that you can do for your older clients would also apply uh, to our current clients. Um, I have a friend who has a client who is now in a coma. What do you do? Because of COVID, what do you do? Um, what happens when your client is not uh, capable of helping you and going forward and you're litigating a case, you're in the middle of a case, what do you do? These, these issues can come up, not just for elders, but for everyone, um, especially our population of clients, because we are, our population of clients are at risk because they already have uh, pre-existing issues. So Lizzie is my, Lizzie is my special guest. Um, Lizzie works here um, and she is our, uh, you know, senior uh, attorney of the older adult, manager of the attorney of older adult programs at CLSMF. Um, she also reminds me not to say old people, um, but I do it anyway. And um, 
um, she has, she's going to go over a couple things very quickly that I think will be helpful to all of us, um, not just in aging, but with all our clients with COVID-19. So thank you for popping in, Lizzie, and she will have a more extensive presentation next week. So please join us then. But Lizzie? Yeah, a couple of things. First, you mentioned that you can ask for a reasonable accommodation if the person is disabled, but there's also to, something to remember that 26.5% of Floridians, and there's over 20 million people who reside in Florida, 26.5% are over the age of 60. In 2016, the AARP re, uh, reported that over 161,000 grandparents were raising their grandchildren. So that may also be grounds for a potential reasonable accommodation for familiar status, especially if some of the noise complaints, unauthorized guests, or maybe the person who needs the um, pet, maybe the grandchild, the minor grandchild that's now residing with the grandparent. Um, as far as some of the elder issues that going to rise due to possibly COVID or just the nature of someone being disabled will be diminished capacity. And there's a difference between the diminished capacity and guardianship. The guardianship goes more to incompetency and diminished capacity. Diminished capacity over the last, I believe, five years or so has been a major issue that the Florida Bar has been addressing in many, many, many CLEs across the state because it is an increasing issue when we're litigating. It probably has always been there, but this is now something that has becoming uh, more of a problem and we have a lot of ethical issues which i'm not going to address today so when it comes to diminished capacity when i see a client with diminished capacity or if i have a co-worker and we're talking consulting on how we can best address the needs of that particular client holistically i always ask them have you read florida rules of civil procedure 1.260 b 1.260B goes to a suggestion of incapacity. It follows the same procedure of a suggestion of death. And basically you're saying, hey, your honor, this person cannot effectively participate in their, in their case. They cannot effectively assist me in representing, defending their action. Um, and so therefore they cannot appreciate the consequences of this legal action and we need a basically like an attorney at litem which really is in debate of, of whether that's appropriate method in in some of our cases but in this particular case we need someone who can represent the interests of this particular particular litigant because they cannot assist themselves so you can file a suggestion of incomp incapacity and you can request a hearing under the florida rules of civil procedure how that's going to work out is, is it all depends on the type of case. I find that if you're in a foreclosure, I learned a couple of years ago that these that some foreclosure mills have a little kitty, and I say kitty fund. So often they will pay for that that attorney at litem slash guardian at litem to be appointed to represent the interests of the litigant and to move the case along. As far as paying for a guardianship usually almost always it's a flat out i'm not paying for that because guardianships are typically three to five thousand dollars is timely and they're just not going to pay for it and, it and i haven't seen judges who's going to make them pay for it another thing with diminished capacity is you have lizzie, ethical lizzie can i just chime in there yeah. with the um with the suggestion of incapacity uh, i've found that when i filed one in my eviction case mm -hmm. believe it or not, um, with a disabled client, um, uh, the court, no one knew what to do. So it just ended up resolving itself. Um, but um, don't let the cost or the fact that one's, no one's going to pay for it uh, keep you from doing it because you have an obligation. Your bar card is your obligation to do so. Yes. Um, so please remember that you have to file that even if it's not, even if you don't know what to do after, you have to put the court on notice because that's your obligation as an attorney. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and, and that's a good point that, 
I know in my first case, no one really did it in office, so I had to figure it out on my own. But I found that Ballard versus Wood, which is a 50 CA that's been around since 2004, is still in effect, and it gives the court a lot of guidance. It, it, I believe it was some kind of foreclosure or something like that kind of case. It was a real estate case. And the mm -hmm. judge, and, and I believe the appellate court uh, referenced that just by the judge being aware of the incapacity, even if the lawyer didn't know what the process was, put um, basically put the case in jeopardy if the judge goes ahead and issues a judgment like they did in that particular case without addressing the incapacity of that particular litigant. So, so the fifth, so, yes, so it was reversed and it was sent back on remand for rehearing. So they had to address that. Okay. Another thing I find is that you got caregivers. So you have third parties and the Florida bar has all kind of ethical rules about third parties. We have best practices about third parties. So when do you talk to the third party? When can a lawyer talk to the third party? Every lawyer is different. I, I first pull my client into the room to talk to my client to determine what my client know and don't know. What, how can they help me? Can they help me? Can they give me the information? Do they need this third party? Who is this third party? Is the third party just someone who's driving them to the office to drop them off? Is the third party a relative who's overly involved and into the case is not and it's not necessary? How much information do I need from the third party? Because even if I talk to the third party, I still have an ethical obligation to limit my disclosure and my actions with them to as much as needed to uh to effectively assist my client client. So I do in some cases and I don't in some cases, just like we have people call in and say they have a POA. And just because you're a power of attorney, do I need you? My client is totally competent. And on top of that, you're calling me, my client is calling me for a will. Why would I take my directions from you with the power of attorney to draft a will or something else that's as significant when I need the client? And because I'm always concerned about exploitation. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention that, Lizzie. It, it, it can go both ways. I've, I've had it where um, a third party will kind of illuminate the situation for you because the client is, can't even tell you the extent of their issues. And then we've also had it where the other person, like you said, is, is a negative influence on the situation and putting pressure on them, especially with the elderly clients. Um, you may have an older child who is physically imposing. Um, or someone who's manipulating them. So you have to be aware that you have to kind of separate them and talk to them separate and, and be aware if someone doesn't want you to talk to this other person first by themselves, because that's that's a sign. Yes. And lastly, I briefly talk about access to premises. Andrea mentioned about, about what should we do about a client who's in COVID? Well, if they have COVID, that, that creates extra issues also like that particular person more than likely is going to need a guardianship whether it's temporary for 90 days uh, as an emergency guardianship or whether it's limited or uh, plenary that's something it all depends because we don't really know the long-term effects of what's going to happen from those who have been diagnosed with COVID. Another issue is access to premises. In the meantime, how do we get their um, their stuff or their belongings? And it's a simple little piece of paper, like like an addendum to a contract, where someone can, while they're cognizant, of course, can simply go ahead and pre-nominate someone to be responsible to gather and take possession of their personal belongings in the event of an incapacity or death. And I think that's all the time I have. Oh, thank you, Lizzie. Uh, yes, that that notice would be is very helpful, and I think we should be suggesting it to our clients, especially in the age of COVID. Um, who can enter your apartment should something happen to you? Um, that's an important thing. So even though it's helpful for uh, our elder clients, think of these things and start kind of they could be suggested and they can have it as advanced planning. Um, you with COVID going on, we have to consider this for all our clients and we may try and bring it up to all our clients, you know, have you considered, especially if they're sick, uh, a lot of our clients are sick, they have existing conditions that make them more susceptible. So it's a real concern who can get in and talk to my, who can access my apartment, who's going to take care of my animal, right? These are yep. all things we need to consider in the age of COVID um, because 
it can you can be fine one day and the next day not okay so christy um i am yeah. um going over my time um would we like me to finish and then we could take a shorter break and keep going would that be okay with everyone sure i think five minutes will give everyone time to stretch oh, five minutes <laughs> Attorney, I can talk forever. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide and then the next slide. Okay. All right, pets, service animals, emotional support animals. These are the ones that everybody loves. Mm -hmm. All right, so next slide. Those are the HUD opinions um, that I am aware of in regards to and the ADA guidelines in regards to um, service animals and emotional support animals. Um, there was a guide in 2013 and a new one came out this year. Um, next slide. What is a pet? Anyone, what's a pet? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, a pet is an animal uh, or uh, domestic, usually domesticated, uh, kept for the, the pleasure rather than utility. Um, and it is not a service animal or emotional support animal. Okay, next slide. Service animal, um, an animal that is trained to assist a disabled person with one or more aspects of their disability. So I got a couple true or false. So we, got, we only got a little bit of time, so you guys got to participate quick. Um, true or false, an animal can, any animal can be a service animal, true or false? False. Um, a service animal in training is a service animal, anyone? True or false? You could just write T or F, true or false. You got a couple falses and one true. For uh, uh, a service animal in training is a service animal. Right. That is a service animal in training is an emotional support animal. Um, it's only a service animal when it is trained uh, to assist with one or more aspects of the disability. So if it's not trained yet, it is not a service animal. Um, uh, next, a service animal must be professionally trained, true or false. What do you false. think? Got a lot of false. Yes, it is false. You guys are good. The handler can be the person who trains the animal. Um, so then that leads us to the last one. A service animal must be certified. Mm. True or false? Got a couple trues and a couple falses. About evenly split. Okay, you guys are excellent. I love you guys. Service animal must be certified, that is false. That is a preconceived notion that a lot of people have. There is no service animal service certification. Um, next slide. When you are dealing with a service animal, there is only two permissible inquiries. Is this dog a service animal? Um, and what work has the dog been trained to perform? By the way, there are only technically two service animals, a dog and a miniature horse. Uh, no other animal is a service animal. That means Lizzie, no monkey. That's an inside joke between me and Lizzie. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and so that's the only inquiry that can be made in regards to a service animal. And even then you can't make that inquiry if it's obvious what the service animal is doing. So if it's a person with a service animal next to them, you can't even make an inquiry. So um, the vest isn't required, the ID isn't required, none of that is required, but they do it to reduce the likelihood that they will be um, questioned, right? But the service animal must always be under the person's control and that is not necessarily a leech. Sometimes an animal is trained to go in in advance for uh, someone who was in the military and they have uh, PTSD, their dog goes in, make sure the room is clear, and then comes back. Can't happen on a leash. So be aware, a leash is not always required. Um, and so if one of your agreements with your providers is um, the animal must always be leashed, uh, be aware um, that that is, does not always have to be the case. 
Um, and if an entity has to comply with ADA and the Fair Housing Act, they have to do both. So they have to start with, is this animal a service animal? And if it is, the inquiry stops. And if it isn't, then they move on to the emotional support animal inquiry. Um, so please be aware of that. Uh, next page. Emotional support animals. Um, uh, they provide emotional support and comfort that alleviates one or more identified effects of a person's disability. Ooh, I needed a space in there. Uh, true or false, a housing provider can ask for documentation of disability related need for emotional support animal from a healthcare professional. True or false? You guys gotta be quick because we're running out of time. Between true and false. It is true. Per the HUD guidelines, um, it should be a healthcare professional. Um, and it's emotional support animal. Uh, true or false, housing provider can require a tenant to complete an accommodation form and allow contact with a doctor to verify disability um, and doctor is not from an online scam. That Everyone is, says false. You guys got it, it's false. Uh, if your letter says what it needs to say, they don't ever need to fill out a form. They don't ever need to con be contacted. Uh, the doctor never needs to be contacted. Um, the, the letter from the doctor should vouch for the animal under the new guidelines, true or false? False. Yes, always false. And the last one, any animal could be emotional support animal, true or false? We're kind of evenly split between true and false. Uh -huh. Well, some of you have read the new guidelines, but it is still true. Any animal could be an emotional support animal. It's just going to be harder for some than others. All right, next page. On the next slide, these are the animals commonly, commonly kept in households. This is per the new HUD guidance. All right. Next slide. These are unique animals. All right. So uh, I used to give this presentation and say, Craig, the gator, could be my emotional support animal and tell me why I can't have them, right? That That is technically off now, right? So we have Craig, we have Shirley, we have Brian, right? I love animals. These are my animals. How can I get them to be my emotional support animal, right? This is what I need. The doctor says I need it. So how do I get it to happen? Well, under the new HUD guidance, um, you have the, uh, as the requester, a substantial burden of demonstrating a disability related and therapeutic need for this specific animal or this specific type of animal. So again, going to the monkey, which makes me and Lizzie laugh, is because we had an emotional support animal case or our service animal, I can't remember, and it was a monkey. And monkeys have their own issues because they have to be come through um, another department, they're regulated, it's just a mess. So if somebody has an emotional support monkey, run, don't, just, just run. Stay away from the monkeys. It's real complicated with monkeys. Um, Shirley, now how can I have Shirley as my emotional support animal? Well, when you're dealing with an autistic child, they sometimes have a response to chickens for some reason, I'm not sure why. Or so you have to provide them with a coop and that type of thing, but there is a possibility that you can have a doctor say that you need, that, uh, you need Shirley as an emotional support animal as opposed to a dog. Um, but I think under the new guidelines, you're going to have a real hard time getting Craig now. So I got to give Craig to a sanctuary. Okay. Next slide. And uh, oh, good. We're almost done. Drafting your reasonable accommodation request. Okay, kids, this is the important part. I have a sample reasonable accommodation request in the document. So don't worry. Um, you have to ID the, re the requester, give the address state whether it is mental or physical disability. Um, you need to state that the housing provider is subject to the Fair Housing Act. Um, give some Fair Housing Act language. Um, the state the situation that has prompted the letter. For instance, my client received um, a seven day notice in regards to an unauthorized animal. Um, my client 
um, has had this animal for years and it is their emotional support animal um, and that type of thing. And then you need to state clearly um, what is being requested. You have to be specific. Um, you can't um, just say reasonable accommodation request. You have to be specific as to what you want because if you if they don't do something that you didn't request, they haven't done anything wrong. So know and get to know in advance what type of things should be in your request and then give them a deadline to get back to you and how to do so. And a new guideline say 10 days by email, by letter. Um, and attach a healthcare provider letter if needed, right? So when would you not need a doctor's note? Well, if uh, your client needs an assigned parking space and they're in a wheelchair, that does not require a doctor's note, right? It's an obvious disability and, a, and an obvious need. They just need an assigned parking space. And sometimes they will come back and say, well, there's plenty of parking. No, it doesn't matter your client is entitled to an assigned disabled parking spot, always. Please remember that. Healthcare provider letter. So, <laughs> what is this? Every time I do a reasonable accommodation request, nine times out of 10, the doctor's letter is wrong, right? It's wrong. It either gives too much or not enough. It's wrong. Um, and so the language will come back and it will say, Please allow, uh, my client would prefer, uh, let them have their pet. All kind of language that is not helpful, right? So um, the doctors, the, doc, the healthcare providers letter should say that this is a re what the accommodation request is. Um, if it is an emotional support letter, it, it, it's best to identify the animal. Um, it's my client's Chihuahua Pikachu. My client's seven pound Chihuahua Pikachu. Uh, as her emotional support animal, and she's requesting an exemption from her provider. Um, and to qualify for that exemption, she must be disabled pursuant to the Fair Housing Act, and I give the Fair Housing Act language. Um, and as a result of her disability, the, the animal is needed, 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 need, not preferred, not wanted, not liked, needed to alleviate one or more symptoms uh, or alleviate or mitigate one or more symptoms of the disability. Um, and in my letter, which I stole from Marty, the lawyer, um, and tweaked a little bit, and he's presenting next week, I say, listen, um, if you agree with the above, you can put it in a letter on your own letterhead, or for your convenience, you could just sign and send it back. Let me tell you, every time I send out that letter, I get it signed, I get it sent back, and there's no issues. Doctors don't want to think too much about this. And, and I've come to the place where you just have to give them the letter. Don't send the client off and say, this is what I need. Tell, the, tell your doctor, this is what you need. It will never happen. It will just waste time. Do the letter, have them sign a HIPAA request and send it off and you will get it back. Because if your doctor agrees, they'll just sign it in the back. If they don't, they won't. But that is the best thing that you can do. If you take, uh, Marty <laughs> did this when we were rehearsing. If you remember one thing from this presentation, draft your own doctor's letters. <laughs> and there's a sample in your um, handouts um, that I drafted for you. Um, and I hope that you will find it helpful. So um, do we have any questions? I am running over time and I so apologize to my fellow presenters. I wanted to make sure we went back to the question about how to prove disability and the need for reasonable accommodation in senior complexes. If right. You to answer that. What What was the question? I don't remember. I'm um, going back. That's the gist of what I remember. Well, <laughs> if you're in a senior complex, um, there you can prove disability if there is a disability, right? So if this person is disabled or regarded as disabled or you know any of those things then they're disabled um just because it's a senior complex doesn't mean they don't have to comply with the fair housing act exactly and if it's something new like a new illness like whether they have dementia or, or something like that you can always get a doctor's letter to support mm -hmm that they have a new disability even though it's, they're not getting social security disability necessarily Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that makes sense. Um, one more, can you explain the circumstances when the landlord ignores the request for a reasonable accommodation? What alternatives does a person have to get the reasonable accommodation? Well, I'm glad you asked. One of the things you can do is file a non opening complaint which we're going to discuss next. So you are in the right place. Um, another thing you can do is file a federal lawsuit, which we are going to be discussing next week. So those are your two options. They must comply or you file a housing complaint or a 903 complaint. But all of this starts with your reasonable accommodation request, which is why I started with this presentation. You have to have a proper RA. And if you don't, they haven't done anything wrong. So it starts with you. Your, your request must be uh, what it needs to be to trigger their responsibility. So this is how it starts. You start with a good reasonable accommodation request and then you move on should they fail to comply. Um, okay, we got some clarification about the senior complex question. Um, the questioner wanted to know how you get a reasonable accommodation for repairs to common areas without getting stuck in the landlord tenant zone, i.e. the landlord or HUD argues it's not a reasonable accommodation. Mm. I think for that one, I probably need to know more. Um, so um, on the next slide, you will see my email um, and you can just email it to me and we'll talk about it. And we have a question about service yes, animals or emotional support animals. If someone has a monkey or another unique animal as an ESA, can they be allowed to take the animal into a public place like a grocery store? Okay, emotional support animal is not a service animal um, and it is for your home. That's why it falls under um, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It is for your home and your home only. Okay, we got one more. If a person has requested a handicapped parking space, do they get the right to have the space marked just for them? Or how are they protected as the only person using that parking spot? Yes, you need to request an assigned parking space. So in your reasonable accommodation request, you don't just request a parking spot. You request an assigned parking spot. That's how you ensure that they are the only person using it. And yes, they are entitled to an assigned parking spot because God forbid they come home and someone's in the spot and they can't get out. And they need to get into their car or they need to get out of their car and pretty promptly. Um, so yes, uh, you need to request in your accommodation request a assigned parking spot. And then you need to know whether you need um, two parking spaces or one if the space isn't there. Right. So if the client needs a wheelchair, uh, has a wheelchair and needs room to get out and there's no existing space that, where you want the spot, then you're going to be taking up two spaces. Um, if the client just needs an assigned space, um, so there's no issue with parking, then that's something different. So you need to know what your client needs that involves talking to your client and getting that information. All right. Thank you for all that good information. We got some compliments coming in too about thanking you for all the good information. So let's go ahead and take a five minute break. If everyone could be back at 1035, we'll start with our next speaker, James Barakal from HUD. Peace, Mute yourself. Uh -uh.
Welcome back, everyone. I am happy to welcome Katherine Hansen, who is a senior staff attorney at Disability Rights Florida. And in the interest of time, we'll save questions for the end of her presentation. Catherine, you're still muted. There, sorry. Okay, hello everybody. Can you hear me now? Christy, can everybody hear me? Yes, good. Okay, good. okay so today I'm gonna talk about um, some things that you might wanna think through during the advocacy process. If you're filing an administrative complaint or thinking about going to court, um, there are a couple typos in there, some mine, some not, uh, so please forgive those. But before I start, I want everyone to remember that you're um, welcome and encouraged to please call me or email me if you have any fair housing questions or if you want to co-counsel on a case. Um, I will repay the favor by asking to possibly send you a case. Um, we at Disability Rights Florida are a statewide organization. Um, I do only housing law involving people with disabilities. So um, I really need a network of legal aid and other attorneys throughout the state so that we can effectively help as many people um, as possible. So please um, feel free to call or email me and talk about fair housing stuff. Next slide. So first there are some materials that you wanna make sure you have at hand when you're really working on any fair housing case. Um, the one at the top is the uh, Complaint Intake Investigation and Conciliation Handbook, which you can find online. It's not super user-friendly in that you have to download a number of separate PDFs, but this is the rule book that HUD is supposed to follow when it's doing an investigation of an administrative complaint. So if you want to know what the rules of the road are, that's where you can look. And like I said, that's available online. There's also a memorandum from HUD called Reasonable Cause Under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, it's pretty old at this point, but it has good information in it, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, if you have the financial ability to get what I call the Red Book or Schwimm's Housing Discrimination Law and Litigation um, book, you should get it. You can use it online. It's a great resource. Um, it has the answer to pretty much every question you are going to ask, um, and the online uh, version is pretty user friendly. Um, as far as valuing complaints uh, and damages, which we'll talk about, you want to definitely um, be familiar with the HUD and Department of Justice's recent accomplishments website where you can find recent settlements, complaints, conciliations, that type of thing. Um, and then Brad Pitt over there is telling us about the fair housing list. Um, it is a closed list, so if you want to be on a listserv that is all fair housing all the time, then you should speak to somebody who does fair housing and see whether or not you can get an invitation. Um, I really recommend if you do fair housing work um, to get on that list. It's a great way to reach fair housing lawyers from across the country, post your questions, help other people, um, share cases, all of those things. So one of the things that's in the Red Book, uh, the Schwem Book, that you really might find useful. There are um, damages worksheets to, help, worksheets to help you value your cases. Um, there's charts of settlements and awards. There's obviously the law. Um, one thing that's not on my slide, which really should be, is your client. Know thy client is really important as far as knowing what to do um, when you're litigating a fair housing claim because a lot of fair housing claims are about the impact on your client, um, their emotional distress, how they reacted to discrimination. So it's really important to know um, your client. Also not on the list is a law firm called Brancard and Brancart, which is out of California. They also have great materials that they're happy to share. Um, they have all sorts of really great worksheets and um, spreadsheets to help you value your case. And they also have intake spreadsheets, where, which are very useful to make sure that you have collected all the materials that you need. Um, so we're going to talk about administrative complaints, um, and we can go to the next slide. I think it's important to remember that you don't have to choose between an administrative complaint and a complaint in state or federal court um, yet, yeah, anyway. You can file both an administrative complaint with HUD or a substantially equivalent agency and go to court at the same time. Um, you can do that until basically the trial has commenced or you are starting the hearing process before the ALJ. And if you wanna read the statute, you can look at 3612F, um, which tells you about the effective trial. 
on administrative proceedings, and you'll see that the ALJ may not continue an administrative proceeding after the beginning of a trial in a civil action. Um, so there are some reasons that you may want to do both at the same time. Um, you can go to the next slide. So depending on your client, you may want to file an administrative complaint and a federal lawsuit, or what is more common is to file an administrative complaint um, while you're preparing to go to federal court or to get more information to support a federal lawsuit. Um, so why would you want to do both or why would you want to start with the administrative process? Well, the administrative process offers all sorts of benefits, um, including tolling, which means that your statute of limitations is not running during the time that your complaint is pending with the administrative agency. Um, you get free discovery. You know, your, your investigator, your HUD investigator, um, or whoever is investigating for your local agency um, can get documents, they can talk to witnesses, they can interview people. Um, administrative complaints are a great way to avoid more protracted, expensive litigation. You can learn about weaknesses in your case, which is very important. Administrative complaints are really easy to file. Um, and I think Mr. Barakal was talking about me when he talked about lengthy administrative complaints. Um, and you also get free monitoring, which is really great, right? When you settle a case through HUD, HUD will make sure that the respondent follows the law for some period of time after the complaint is closed, which is not usually something that you as an advocate can do. So there are lots of benefits to going through the administrative process. Um, and so it's important to take advantage of that, I think, um, if you can. Next slide. So after you file your administrative complaint, um, you'll be assigned to an investigator. So the investigator is a neutral party. Their job is to gather information from credible sources and figure out whether or not there's cause to believe that the Fair Housing Act has been violated. Um, and that quotation comes from that handbook that I was telling you about that you can get online, which is HUD's investigation handbook. Um, there are some things that the investigator is not supposed to do. They're not supposed to contact your client without your consent. Um, this is a pet peeve of mine. I have heard of attorneys who will permit their client to be interviewed by the investigator without their presence. I would strongly counsel against that, against letting your client really talk to anybody involved in the case without you being there. Um, so if they're interviewing your client, you, know, you have the right to be there, whether it's by conference call or whatever else, um, to make sure you know what was said and so you can advocate for your client um, if needed. So at the close of the case, whether there's a cause determination or not, there will be a final investigative file. Always, always, always request the final investigative file. You don't know what kind of great stuff might be in there. Um, I recently had a case that was a straightforward emotional support animal case, but when I got the investigative file, respondent had gone to all the trouble to write down all sorts of discriminatory statements in their materials from their condo board meeting. How great is that to have if you're thinking about going to federal court or if you're trying to, to settle the case, which is what happened in that circumstance. So always request that final investigative report and make sure you get the entire report, not just the cause determination. Um, when you're working with your investigator, you know, you want to be obviously professional, um, be helpful to the investigator. They have a lot of cases, they have to deal with a lot of lawyers, um, a lot of pro se people. If they need information from you or have a question for you, um, do what you can to respond in a timely fashion. Give them as much information as you can. Um, and remember, you know, as an attorney, it's always an opportunity to advocate for your client. So if it's obvious from the questions from the investigator that they have some concern about whether or not the law applies to your client, um, that's an opportunity to provide your assessment of what the law says. Um, okay, I think that's it for that one. So you can go to the next slide. So in addition to possibly trying to settle your case, um, you know, one of your goals in the administrative process is to get a cause finding. So after HUD investigates or your local agency investigates, they will determine whether or not there's reasonable cause to believe that the Fair Housing Act has been violated. But the Fair Housing Act doesn't define reasonable cause, right? So what the reasonable cause memorandum tells us is that reasonable cause is essentially something between mere suspicion and a preponderance of the evidence. You have to, or the facts have to establish um, that there's a reasonable probability that a violation of the law occurred. So essentially the investigator will be analyzing your facts in light of the law to see whether it's that a violation may have occurred. 
Um, next slide. There's a typo on this one. So I think this is some key language from the reasonable cause memo that I come back to over and over again. Um, and I think one of the things that I've used on more than one occasion is if there's conflicting but reasonably believed evidence, the evidence may be construed in favor of the complainant. So sometimes there's not documentary evidence about whether or not something happened. Sometimes it's just people's testimony, right? And if that testimony is credible, um, it can be believed. The memo also explains that reasonable cause is present when facts exist to support a valid theory that the act was violated so that a reasonable person could conclude that there was a violation. So you just wanna make sure that you really understand that standard. Um, you know, it's not a federal court standard, so you know what is needed to get a determination of a reasonable cause. Um, and you can ensure that that is what happens during the investigation. In uh, the HUD process, there's no formal appeal, um, but you can request reconsideration. There's not like a formal form or anything like that, um, but you can write to HUD if you disagree with their finding and explain what error you believe that they have made. Next slide. So what can you get out of this process? What can your client get? Well, the relief available in the administrative process and in court is different, obviously. Um, in the administrative process, you can get damages, which includes emotional distress. I have highlighted that uh, for a reason, which we'll talk about in a bit, hopefully, if we have time. Um, you can get permanent injunctive relief, equitable relief. So that would mean I want my emotional support animal approved. I want to be able to rent this apartment. Um, you can get attorney's fees and you can get a civil penalty, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, in state or federal court, you can get some of those same things, but you can also get punitive damages. Um, which we'll also talk about. So just keep in mind that the relief that you can get, the things that your client can get, do differ depending on what forum you're in. So you need to keep that um, in mind. Oh, and before we leave this slide, I will tell you something that I'm sure you've been told before. Make sure when you're working on these cases that you're keeping good contemporaneous time records. That will be um, important, especially if you end up in court. Next slide. When you're wondering what the civil penalty uh, may be, which can be useful for negotiating purposes, you want to make sure you check the most recent civil penalty. So the um, maximum civil penalty will change, hopefully go up um, year by year. It's available online, it's published in the Federal Register. This is just the most recent one that I uh, found for 2019. And it tells you where you can find the regulation that talks about the maximum civil penalty. It tells you how much the penalty is. So if you have no priors, the maximum civil penalty is more than $21,000, which is not nothing, right? So if you're settling a case, you might keep that number in mind as possible exposure for the respondent, right? Even if you're just getting a civil penalty, that's a pretty hefty penalty. Next slide. So punitive damages. Um, I know I'm not super familiar with punitive damages, and I think you know it's not something that um, folks are able to try to get every day, uh, but punitive damages, just keep in mind, are meant to punish the, the respondent or the defendant for their outrageous conduct so that they don't do it again, right? It's not about compensating your client, it's about deterring the respondent from whatever discriminatory act they did. Next slide. So another way to think about it um, is, did the defendant or the respondent show reckless or callous disregard to the plaintiff's rights? So that basically means they knew what the law was and they broke the law anyway. That's when you're gonna look at whether or not punitive damages are available. Next slide. Um, if you're looking at an intentional discrimination case, and again, you're in state or federal court, not in an administrative proceeding, um, you may expect a punitive damages award, meaning they're common in cases involving intentional discrimination. Um, the size of the defendant or respondent and their financials are relevant because the fine has to be sufficient enough to punish and deter that defendant. Um, and just remember that punitives are not intended to compensate the plaintiff. And a case law basically says that the punitive amount will be upheld unless it shocks the judicial conscience. Um, you can see that Judge Judy there is looking at an unreasonable punitives award. You can go to the next slide. So this is my approach to conciliation. Um, I have never turned down the offer for conciliation. 
I think it's always a good idea to get a feel for your opposing counsel, the facts that may not support your claim, just to work with your client through the conciliation process. So my approach is to go into a conciliation thinking this is respondents chance to avoid federal litigation. And if you're conciliating after a cause determination, even more so, right? So conciliation is not a throwaway meeting. You wanna be prepared for conciliation. Um, you wanna be serious about your settlement demand. You know, the, your FAP, your investigating agency or HUD, they're gonna be you know, looking for relief in the public interest, which they should, right? That's their charge. Um, but you can go farther than that. You need to know what your client wants. You know, it may not, your client may not care whether or not respondent gets training, although that will be part of the settlement. They may want, I have a client who wants enough money to buy an accessible van, right? So what your client wants will vary. Um, and when you're in conciliation, you know, you should demand what, what your client wants to get at the end of the process. Um, some clients just want training and an apology, although, um, it does seem that getting an apology from respondents can be more difficult than some other things. Um, you know, conciliation is a great opportunity to use the good work of HUD or your investigating agency to resolve the claim quickly for your client before they have to go to federal court, which is going to take at least two years. Um, and now who knows how long that would take. So when you walk into conciliation, you really want to be prepared you want to have authority from your client if they're not going to be there. You want to know what you expect to walk away from the table with. And if you don't settle, you want to know what your plan is, right? If you don't ever plan to file a case in federal court, then that's going to change your analysis in conciliation. You can go to the next slide. So how much is your case worth? It depends. There is no sort of standard answer. Um, it depends on the strength of your claim. So that means can you prove it? right? Um, how long was your client injured? So did they not have their emotional support animal for two weeks or was it two years? Did they face an eviction filing? You know, all sorts of facts um, determine, you know, how, quote, serious the claim is. Um, who's your client, right? So I was recently valuing a case. We just set a settlement demand. I found one case with similar facts as far as the violation. It was an emotional support animal case and it settled for 50 grand. And I thought, well, that's a pretty hefty award an administrative case for that kind of violation so i looked and the plaintiff was a 9-11 first responder and a navy vet and on and on so you know he is a very sympathetic um plaintiff and i suspect that that led to a more significant award than you might get in some other instances so you know know who your client is know if they're credible on the stand um, so that you know what would be reasonable to expect in their case um, you also need to know, obviously, where your client is, what court you would be in. If you did have to go to state or federal court, you need to know whether or not you have any evidence of their emotional distress. You know, do they keep a diary? Do they talk to people? Um, did they have a therapist? Do they have a doctor? Um, and you want to know what a respondent's exposure is, right? So they're on the other side of the table. They're thinking, you know, should we settle this now? How much is this worth? So you want to be able to explain to a respondent why you're going to win. Um, the liability that they're facing and how much it's going to cost them if they don't settle this case at conciliation. Um, in that red book I talked about on the second slide, the Schwem um, handbook about fair housing law, there are uh, tables that will tell you recent um, and older um, settlements and jury awards in all sorts of fair housing cases, hundreds and hundreds of them. So um, that is one great resource. Um, there are other case settlement um, charts floating around, which you can get if you're on the fair housing list. Um, and then there is the DOJ recent accomplishments website where you can just do a simple word search and look at you know five or six um, recent similar settlements to get an idea of what your case might be worth. Um, but there is nobody who's gonna be able to tell you an exact answer to that question. Next slide. So I mentioned attorney's fees a couple times. Um, one thing that's important to know is that a prevailing defendant, so if the defendant wins, if you sue somebody and they win, um, they're gonna get fees against your client only if your claim is frivolous, unreasonable, or groundless, or if you continue to litigate after it clearly became so. So why is that, right? Well, HUD, Congress, the courts, they don't want um, plaintiffs who have suffered discrimination to not complain um, not go to court because they fear 
a fee award against them. Um, so you, you know, that is a risk. You do need to counsel your client that payment of attorney's fees is a risk if they lose, um, but the bar as far as prevailing defendants getting fees is pretty high in a, in a fair housing case. You can go to the next slide. So when you're thinking about damages um, as part of settlement, or if, if you're in court, um, the purpose of an award of actual damages is to put the plaintiff in the same position they would have been without the injury. But in a lot of fair housing cases, you know, you're talking about distress, um, not something you can really fix. So you know, money is the way that we compensate for that. As far as emotional distress, you don't necessarily have to have um, an expert. In the Red Book, the Schwem Book, there's a long string of cases, which are mostly race discrimination cases, where the courts basically say, you know, all reasonable people understand why that behavior, that racist behavior, would be upsetting and would cause distress. Um, and so you don't need an expert to come and tell anybody that being discriminated against causes distress. Um, you may want an expert depending on your facts, it may be beneficial, but there are cases that settle with emotional distress damages with no expert. Um, you wanna know when you're talking about damages and whether you can prove emotional distress. You know, like I said before, did your client talk to anybody? Do they have a therapist? Uh, do they keep a diary? What evidence do you have to support the causal connection between the, de the defendant's discrimination and your client's um, distress? Um, so a couple things that you can do to try to prepare yourself to value damages when you're in an administrative proceeding or in court is you can use the emotional distress damages worksheet, um, which I'm happy to send you or is in the Red Book. Um, it does a good job of sort of just prompting your client to think about all of the um, effects that discrimination may have had on them, including you know, loss of sleep, loss of appetite, um, anger, anxiety, um, and the worksheet's just a good way to get them thinking about the ways that discrimination may have impacted them, and it's good for you to have a written record of that information. Um, depending on the client, sometimes I mail it like with a pen and a stamp um, because you really want that information back from them. You know, clients have a lot going on. Um, and they may not want to take the time to do that, but it is really important. Also, tell your client to keep notes. So I tell my clients to keep a, a pad of paper and a pen by their phone. Anybody they talk to about the situation, a call from their manager, maintenance hanging out outside, looking through their window, whatever it is, they need to write it down. When it happened, who did it, how they felt about it. Um, you know, you want to document all of those things contemporaneously if you can. You can go to the next slide. So when you're in conciliation or otherwise, um, you know, doing some sort of settlement negotiation, these are just some terms that you might want to consider. Obviously not an exhaustive list, um, but there are some issues that folks don't always think about that they probably should. Um, so obviously you want, you want to think about damages, right? How much is your case worth as far as emotional distress, actual damages, loss of housing opportunity. Um, you, may, you want equitable relief, right? So you want your accommodation granted or whatever um, equitable relief would be appropriate. You might want the respondent to do some affirmative advertising um, to undo the harm they've done in the community through their discrimination. Most likely, um, you're gonna want them to get some training so they don't do that to folks again. Um, they'll need to adopt policies depending on what the violation was. You know, If it's an emotional support animal case, they may need to adopt policies or better policies. Um, you know, I generally try to provide what policy I would like to see them have. And I do that by looking at HUD and DOJ's policies and what they have included in their consent decrees so that I can say, this is the policy we want. And we know that this is a good policy because the Department of Justice wrote this policy. Um, you may want to consider inserting into your settlement that the respondent will not issue what's called a 1099. If you don't know what a 1099 is, you need to look into it. Um, it's a tax form. And I think if you read the form, you'll find that respondent is not required to issue a 1099 just because they pay your client money. Um, and that it's sort of more complex than for this presentation, but um, I would recommend reading about that and thinking about that. Um, you may want to include attorney's fees in your settlement, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, confidentiality is not favored for obvious reasons. You know, we want folks to know who the bad guys are doing the bad stuff. 
Um, and you may want the respondent to display for housing materials, have you know indicia that they don't discriminate on their property. Um, and of course, keep good and contemporaneous time records so that you can talk about fees, um, which we'll be talking about. And monitoring will always be really a part of your settlement if you're working with HUD or another agency, um, which is an important part of relief in the public interest. HUD will make sure that the respondent does what they have promised to do. You can go to the next slide. So if you're in court, obviously attorney's fees are, are awarded by the court um, or, or you would settle um, while you're in court. But if you're in an administrative proceeding, you know, fees are client driven. That means you know, you're only gonna seek fees if that's what your client wants to do in an administrative proceeding like a HUD proceeding. Um, you should talk to your client early about fees um, and determine whether or not that's something they want to do. You need to tell them that that they're not required, that it's not gonna hurt your feelings or make you treat them any differently. Um, if fees are not something that's important to them, some clients don't wanna seek fees, which is fine. And some clients think that you are the best lawyer in the world and they wanna do everything they can to make sure that you get paid for your effort. Um, you know, that is up to the client. Um, you know, they should also know that respondent is likely to bulk at giving fees, especially to a legal aid organization. So if that's something that client is interested in, they need to know that there will come a point when respondent says, I'm willing to pay you complainant, but I'm not gonna pay your lawyer. And your client needs to know if they wanna take that deal, that is fine. Um, but if they don't, then they can do that as well. So you can never, you can never be in conflict with your client. You can never hold up somebody's settlement um, because of fees. That's completely up to the client in an administrative setting. You can go to the next slide. So um, folks sometimes don't like to talk about this, but you have got to think about a couple things before you get into the conciliation room or call. Um, in addition to you know, knowing what your claim is worth and what your client wants and all those things, you need to be thinking about tax implications for your client. So when you get money, um, it is taxable. So you need to know about your client's income, you need to advise your client early and in writing um, about tax liability. Now, obviously you don't know how much you're settling for until it happens, but you don't wanna be in a room doing conciliation and end up with more money than perhaps you thought and then be thinking, oh no, how is this going to impact my client's public benefits, their earned income, income tax credit, their subsidized housing, their food stamps, their Medicaid, you want to have thought about all of those things before you get into that room. Um, so make sure you know your client's income, all the benefits they receive. Talk to your public benefits attorney if you have one. You know, do some research. In my opinion, it is not enough to tell your client go seek the advice of a tax professional. They should do that, um, but I think you have to do more than that so that you can ensure that you you know essentially don't harm your client um, with their recovery. Okay, now I wanna talk just a little bit about substantial equivalency um, before we go to questions, and I'll be interested to see what folks might wanna tell me about this. So substantial equivalency, um, you know, you heard from HUD. HUD obviously investigates a lot of discrimination cases, um, but if you live in a jurisdiction that has a substantially equivalent agency, then your case might get referred there. So if you live in Broward or Tampa, your case might get referred by HUD to a, a FAP um, to do the investigation. So HUD has to certify those agencies as substantially equivalent. And if you wanna look at the regulation, um, 24 CFR 115.200 is where those regulations begin. Um, and what HUD is looking for in those agencies is, um, are the substantive rights the same um, that the agency will be investigating? Are their procedures substantially the same? Are the available remedies substantially the same? So can you get the same thing when you're with the local agency as in Broward as you can get if your claim was sitting with HUD? Um, and the availability of judicial review. Now you can online, you can easily find the list um, of substantially equivalent agencies. I have mine on my wall, I count seven, um, including the Commission on Human Relations. So there aren't that many um, but in bigger jurisdictions, you're gonna have a local substantially equivalent agency. Next slide. 
So there have been some issues about substantial, substantial equivalency specific to the Commission on Human Relations of late, or sort of of late anyway. Um, one problem was that there was some case law in Florida that said you had to exhaust administrative remedies through the Commission on Human Relations or otherwise before you could go to court. Well, the Fair Housing Act doesn't actually say that. Um, and the concern was that that made the Commission on Human Relations not substantially equivalent because the way that the law worked was different according to this case law. Um, so there was legislation, and this language that's on the screen now is from staff analysis of a bill that was very recently passed. Um, you can look at Senate Bill 374 if you wanna see draft of the legislation. Um, when I looked, I couldn't tell whether or not the Senate's website was totally updated, but you can you should be able to read the language of the legislation. It, among other things, it specifies that you are not required to exhaust administrative remedies before you go to court in the state of Florida, um, arguably clearing up that issue about substantial equivalency. But, next slide. Um, the HUD administrative process, if you stay with HUD, you can get actual damages, which includes emotional distress damages. Next slide. And remember that the regulation says that to be substantially equivalent, the secretary of HUD determines whether the agency provides remedies that are substantially equivalent. Next slide. So the case law in Florida, as far as I can read it, um, says that administrative agencies do not have the ability to award non-quantifiable damages, like damages for emotional distress, because those awards are a violation of Article 2, Section 3, and Article 1, Section 22 of the Florida Constitution. So the question that I'm pondering, and thanks to Andrea for having me work on this presentation so that I can have this to ponder, is can agencies be substantially equivalent in Florida if the law says that an administrative agency cannot award mental distress damages because it's a violation of the Constitution? So if you know the answer to that question, please do tell me. Um, otherwise, I will be thinking about that. Um, so I think we have some time for questions, and I know I talk fast, so I am eager to hear if anybody has anything I can help them with um, or any cases they want to talk about. Thank you so much, Catherine. Let me check for questions. Thank you to everyone. I've learned so much today. Okay. <clears throat> One person had a question about what is the other name for the red book you mentioned? So it's, I call it the Schwem, but let me look it up. So Robert Schwem is a, was a, well, he's still alive, but he is retired, I think. Fancy um, lawyer who worked at Kentucky. And let me look it up on my other computer. I think it's called the Housing Discrimination Law and Litigation. Yeah, Housing Discrimination Law and Litigation is what that manual is called. Um, it is pricey, you know, it's not cheap. I think it's one-time purchase right now, it's 1200 bucks, so it's not nothing, surely. Um, but if you are able to do that, even if you're not able to get the updates in the future, it is really a critical resource. I mean, that's where I go first before I post a question on the listserv so folks can tell me that I'm wrong. Um, I always look in the Schwem. he has, great sample pleading, sample discovery. You know, if you're gonna buy one book to do fair housing, that's probably the book that you want. And I don't get any money for saying that, neither does my organization, but I've been using that since I started. Um, especially the online version is really easy to navigate and I find it to be extremely um, helpful. So if I know the answer to something that you asked me, it's probably because I just looked in that book. All right, thank you. And when requesting the investigator's final report, do you do a request to produce the final report or a Freedom of Information Act request? You shouldn't have to do, um, you should just have to do an email. I mean, if there's, there, it should not be contentious. At the bottom of your cause or no cause determination, there'll be a little two sentences that say, if you want this report, email this place. Um, sometimes they'll ask you to pay for it, sometimes not. Usually, if they can transmit it electronically, they'll just email it to you. I mean, it all has to be compiled anyway because they get reviewed by their bosses and all that. So it should be in a format that can be easily provided. Um, 
depending on how long the investigation was, it might be lengthy, um, how many documents they got from respondent, but you shouldn't have to do a public records request. You should just be able to ask the investigating agency for it. Okay, great. And how do you prove damages for someone who is in housing due to discrimination? I have seen opposing lawyers argue that there are no actual damages because the client would have had to pay rent if they were accepted. So you may want to use the loss of housing opportunities worksheet, which basically shows the, the value of the housing. You know, if the housing that you get because you couldn't live where you wanted to is more expensive or is farther from work or is not on the bus line, is farther from your doctor. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that housing while it may physically be a roof on your head, is not equivalent, right? So you want to think about all of those things. And then, of course, there's the damage that's just inherent in being discriminated against and then not being able to live where you wanted to live. Um, but, you know, I'd struggle to find a situation where the housing that is your second choice is not going to be substantially, significantly different than the housing that was your first choice. So, you know, don't discount what may seem like a little thing. You know, if you're 20 minutes instead of 10 minutes from your kid's school, that's not nothing. You know, that's gas, that's time, that's stress, all of those things. Um, and I had some trouble, Christy, hearing the question. So if that didn't answer the question, please let me know and I'll try again. Okay. And how can people get the intake spreadsheet you mentioned? Well, one is from um, Brancart and Brancart, and I don't know if it's just on their website, um, but it's not like, proprietary or anything. So if you email me, I'll have your email address um, and I'm happy to send it to you. Or I'll send, actually, I'll, better, I'll send it to Christine. She can send it to everybody. Perfect. I will send that out to everybody. Um, does a no cause determination have an effect in a subsequent court case? No, absolutely not. It's not going to come in. Um, I mean, I say that just from what I've read. I've not had that come up in my personal experience, but um, no, it's not going to preclude you now. You know, if you get a no cause determination, you know, you may want to think about why that is. Um, but, you know, sometimes administrative agencies are wrong. Um, sometimes they might not have all the information. Sometimes respondents stonewall, don't give them what they need. Um, but no, you can still go to federal court, you know, if you disagree and you think that your case is good you can still um, go to state or federal court absolutely but do you okay. think carefully about why you lost okay we do have a question from andrea i wonder if you can object to handling by a substantially equivalent agency if you are seeking emotional distress damages yeah i don't know andrea you know i don't know <laughs> so i don't know i don't know i don't know what we do about that um I think it's a tough question. You know, the HUD has been talking to the commission about substantial equivalency since that case came out. I can't remember what that was, but it was maybe 13 years ago. Um, but I don't know yet whether there's something that a private individual can do can do regarding substantial equivalency. Um, that's, you know, I'm going to dedicate some time to that in the coming weeks because obviously I think it's really critical, um, but it sounds like it is something that really is out of the commission's hands out of, you know, it seems like if this is a problem, it seems like it's a constitutional problem. So I don't know what we do about that. Um, but if I figure it out or if somebody knows the answer and just wants to tell me, um, we can, I'm sure, provide that answer to everybody who's attended the webinar, but I don't know. Thank you for the great presentation. That's all the questions for you as of now. We do have a question that came in for Mr. Barakal. If Mr. Barakal is able to unmute himself, the question is, uh, if the violation is based on a failure of the respondent to provide documents to a claimant in a readable format, for example, to a blind person, how could that person participate fully in the process? I don't think he's on anymore. Yes, I'm still on. There you are. Uh, repeat the question again, please. Sure. If the violation is based on a failure of the respondent to provide documents to the claimant in a readable format, i.e. in a braille format to a blind claimant, how could that person participate fully in the process? Well, that uh, I would have to check with the investigators because uh, I am not an investigator, so I 
not uh, answer that question, and I don't want to give you false information. So uh, if you provide that question to me, I will get the answer for you. Thank you. I'll email that to you after the presentation. All right. That would be amazing to whoever asked that question, to have a respondent still refusing to provide documents in a readable format in an investigation. <laughs> right. And if anyone comes up with follow-up questions, I'm happy to email them to the presenters. I'll send everyone the link to this recording after the webinar, as well as a link to the Google Drive documents. If you have any trouble accessing them, just email me and let me know. And thank you so much to all all of our panelists, they put a lot of time and effort and love into these presentations and everyone did a fantastic job. So I'm very, very grateful for the time that all of you took on this. And don't forget to register for part two of the Nuts and Bolts of Fair Housing. That is next Monday, May 4th from nine to noon. Got a lot of compliments in the box here. Thank you. Thanks so much for all the good info. You guys rock. So on that don't note. Now your fair housing questions, they're, they're worth a lot. Don't let anybody tell you they're not. <laughs> Lots of thank you, there. So thank you all so much. And I will see hopefully most of you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, James. Bye, everybody. Yeah, Andrea. Yeah, thanks for all your day. Day. Take thanks. care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>